For those of you who follow this podcast, you already know about Disneyland's first holiday season. It was a relatively small affair. In 1955, the park invited choirs to sing traditional Christmas carols, gathering on the -the turn-of-the-century wooden bandstand a stage positioned just off the hub where Carnation Gardens would later be built. The park also hosted the Mickey Mouse Club Circus, which included a holiday finale, a giant Christmas tree made of parachute fabric rising up to fill the big top, as a few Disney characters, the Mouseketeers and Santa, seated in a white sleigh, paraded around the center ring. But my favorite story of that first holiday season comes from Jack Lindquist, hired as the park's first advertising manager. Quote, On Christmas Eve in 1955, he began, I walked up Main Street early in the evening, and on this night, with the garland strung between lampposts, the wreaths hanging in all of the store windows, and the huge Christmas tree, the atmosphere drew me in. Because the park was particularly empty, a family caught my attention. And as the mother, father, and their 10-year-old son and younger daughter walked down Main Street, I followed them. They were dressed neatly, but not stylish. They all held hands. When they arrived at the Christmas tree, the little girl tugged on her mom's arm and said, Mom, this really was better than having Santa Claus. I knew then that Santa wasn't bringing them presents. For this family, their time at the park probably was Christmas. Later, as Lindquist reflected on this, he understood that this park, for which he had recently been hired, had the ability to touch people in unique ways. Quote, We're not a cure for cancer, he understood. We're not going to save the world. But if we can make people that happy for a few hours or for a day, then we're doing something worthwhile. That first year, as the park struggled financially, its decorations were sparse, limited mostly to Main Street, the castle, and the Christmas Bowl stage just off the hub. But Disneyland is a living canvas whose decorations and events change from year to year. In the years that followed that first holiday season, Walt expanded the park's traditions starting in 1956. Today on the podcast, we're going to explore not only that second holiday season, but also how two of the best-known Disney traditions, the parade and candlelight, developed through the 1950s. That is, we'll take a look at how holiday traditions that exist today invented themselves many decades ago. The traditions of holiday music started in 1955 when Walt Disney contacted Dr. Charles Hurt, a professor at USC. Hurt had worked at the university since 1942, where he started the program in choral music. At that time, he took over the existing Madrigal Singers, a group loosely overseen by one of the deans, and formed a new a cappella performance group made up typically of a dozen students intent on careers in music, eventually called the Chamber Singers. One of Dr. Hurt's students recalled, quote, He had a personal call from Walt Disney to bring some choirs out for Christmas and just had some volunteer choirs singing around in front of the castle for the first year. In 1955, Hurt arranged for his chamber singers to work at Disneyland dressed in rented Victorian costumes as carolers for two weeks. Disney also asked him to develop a program to bring visiting school, church, and community choirs as guest performers during the holiday season. These visiting choirs would, a few years later, become the inspiration for the candlelight processional, but that first year, community school and church groups performed small concerts of holiday music on a wooden band stage positioned just to the left of the castle, not far from the entrance to Frontierland. Some of the invitations were arranged through Hertz connections with local choirs, and others were arranged through the entertainment department at Disneyland. Together, these efforts produced a modest Christmas package of community choirs and student performers. In 1956, Hurt returned with his a cappella singers. Again, they were dressed in Victorian costumes and performed around Main Street and in various restaurants. Quote, I trained the Disneyland carolers, Hurt said. This included teaching the singers how to respond to people in the park. For example, if a little girl walked up to one of the singers, the caroler would sing directly to the child. 
At the time, Disneyland leased space on Main Street to outside companies. Timex had a shop, as did Kodak and Gibson greeting cards. There was the Swift Market House, the Upjohn Pharmacy, the Wurlitzer Music Hall, and an actual working branch of Bank of America, where guests could cash checks. Quote, Our primary job, one early performer in Dr. Hertz Group recalled, was to entertain the lessee's customers meaning that live music was used in part to draw customers into the lease stores along Main Street. Another early performer commented on the Victorian costumes, which for years were rented each December. Quote, It was hard work, he said, because the costumes were heavy and it wasn't really cool weather. It was a little bit out of the ordinary for most college choral programs. The singers officially performed from 11 until 7 at night, though they were arranged at times in the full group of 12 in front of the train station. But for most of the day, Disneyland moved the singers up and down Main Street in groups of four while the other eight rested their voices backstage. To do this, Disneyland repurposed the vehicle that they had created the previous year for the Mickey Mouse Club Circus, an elaborate white sleigh designed to be pulled by a small team of horses with the wheels hidden beneath decorative silver blades. In the circus, the sleigh had carried Santa beneath the big top during the show's finale, pulled by a team of miniature horses. But in 1956, the sleigh with its white padded benches and oversized tassels carried four carolers, two men and two women, up Main Street, stopping briefly in front of the shops. It would then return backstage to pick up another group of singers who were now rested. Along with the Victorian carolers for what was officially called Disneyland's second annual holiday festival, the park themed many of its show areas to a turn-of-the-century Christmas, with most of the holiday presentations scheduled around Main Street or on the wooden bandstand, which had now been moved from the hub area to the back of Adventureland. On Main Street itself, lines of garland ornamented with red bells were draped across the street. Holly wreaths dressed with gold and silver ornaments decorated each gas lamp. On top of the Red Wagon Inn, a team placed half-scale reindeer figurines at the front of the roof. And attached to the second and third floor roofs of Main Street buildings were wooden cutouts of various Christmas scenes. Some were religious, such as the three wise men above the Main Street Emporium and a Madonna and child above the bank, and others were traditional. Santa in his red suit and a wagon piled with carolers. Though in its later years, the Christmas tree would find its home in Town Square, in 1956, once again, a 40-foot live tree was placed in the central plaza, or the hub, exactly where the partner statue now stands. Its boughs were lightly dressed with ornaments and silver garland, though the garland only encircled the lower boughs, as though most decorations were placed there by hand. Outside of Main Street, the park added touches of holiday color to Fantasyland and Frontierland. In Fantasyland, the toy store decorated its windows with holiday displays, the castle too was dressed with garland and wreaths, and along the castle's side paths, the white lampposts were encircled with red ribbon, giving them the striped appearance of candy canes. The Golden Horseshoe Saloon hung garland above its entrance, draped in links along its exterior balcony. And in the little town of Rainbow Ridge, where once ran the mine train, a miniature wreath was hung from one of its scale model buildings, the Last Chance Saloon. As for live entertainment, church and school choirs continued to perform at the old bandstand, seasonally renamed the Holiday Bowl, with the bandstand now positioned at the back of Adventureland, in an area called Magnolia Park, roughly where the Swiss Family Robinson Treehouse was later built. The performances would range from community choirs to college choirs, some even featured elementary school children. But one performance that year marked a step toward the candlelight processional. During Disneyland's first year, on the day after Thanksgiving and the opening of the Mickey Mouse Club Circus, the park had hosted a choral event in which multiple choirs sang together in front of the train station. The following year, 
on Saturday, December 15, 1956. This blended choir increased to, as one paper noted, quote, 500 voices strong to officially open Disneyland's Christmas season. Among them were 111 hand-selected members from a high school choir of over 200 students in Redlands, California. Again, they sang a range of songs from Winter Wonderland to Silent Night. Still, this event wasn't the candlelight processional, though by degrees, it was slowly moving in that direction. In 1956 also engaged another event that was to become a long-standing tradition for the park. Disneyland hosted both of the Rose Bowl football teams. Back during the park's first year, only the out-of-state Michigan team made its way to the park. In 1955, the outing was a casual event where players were guests of Walt Disney. After a morning practice at East LA Junior College, 44 Michigan State Spartans with coaches loaded a pair of buses headed for the park. In the parking lot, the players were met by the Disneyland carolers who sang the Michigan State fight song, which was a nice gesture considering all 12 carolers were students at USC. But after that, the college players simply wandered about the park as guests, each of them wearing a suit jacket and tie. Their actual visit was fairly quiet, but the event produced one rather famous AP photo that was picked up in papers across the country. In it, three members of the Michigan team crouched inside of a caged Casey Jr. Circus car pretending to be wild animals. For some papers, the caption read, quote, wild animals, no, Spartans. For others, it read, quote, Spartans all bottled up at Disneyland. The photo appeared in paper after paper across the country, so much so that the public relations team at Disneyland took note and decided to organize a larger event the following year. The following year, 1956, players from both teams specifically Oregon State and the University of Iowa, visited the park a week before Christmas. Though in later years, the visit would become an official press event with an organized tour, in 1956 it was still more of a casual visit, though now with a few formal touches. Both teams, for example, lined up for a press photo, facing each other on the bridge leading to the castle. Afterwards, they dined together at the Red Wagon Inn on Main Street, where they were joined by the Rose Bowl Queen and her court. Again, the event proved successful, both in terms of public goodwill and in placing Disneyland in the news. In the years that followed, the event continued to grow. But along with decorations, the carolers and choirs, and the Rose Bowl connection, Disneyland's second holiday season featured two more important events, one inside the park, and one outside. For much of the park's first year and a half, Disneyland hosted celebrities from Fess Parker with his coonskin cap to the Mouseketeers to Clayton Moore dressed as the Lone Ranger. For the 1956 Christmas season inside the park, Disneyland again solidified its connection to Hollywood film and TV with lead Mouseketeer Annette Funicello, along with the stars of Disney's TV serial Spin and Marty, appearing at the park in the week leading up to Christmas for photos and autographs. This event played on one of the strongest elements in the park's identity, that Disneyland was not only an amusement park with themed lands, it was a park deeply tied to Hollywood culture. And then, outside the park, in cities across the country, the idea of Disneyland was beginning to take root, an amusement park arranged around the visual theme of popular film genres such as the Western and the period drama. Not only had Walt featured the park on his weekly Wednesday night TV show, he had also created a short movie about his creation, which was called Disneyland USA. This short film, 42 minutes in length, was soon to be released worldwide as part of Disney's long-standing People in Places series. 
Other entries in this 17-film series were cultural explorations of regions far from California, such as Samoa, Morocco, and Thailand. But this one film was a 42-minute tour of the park in Technicolor, with its aspect ratio stretched out to CinemaScope. The film had its world premiere that Christmas season on Saturday, December 22, 1956 at the Fox Anaheim Theater at 500 North Harbor Boulevard. In a postmodern flourish, this theater was located on the exact same street as the park itself, meaning that audience members could literally watch on screen a location that they could view in person by driving about five miles down the road. More importantly, this premiere was arranged as a benefit for the St. Joseph Hospital in Orange. As such, Disneyland Entertainment was on board to help sell tickets and arranged for the cast of the Golden Horseshoe Review to appear live on the Fox stage immediately before the film. Tickets cost between $15 and $25. That is, between $30 and 50 times the cost of an average movie ticket in 1956, or 10 times what an actual trip to Disneyland cost during the same year. But as the event was for charity, specifically to fund the expansion of a hospital, the mayor and county supervisors got behind the event. The park as well supported it, absorbing all cost of the premiere so 100% of the funds raised would be given to St. Joseph's Building Fund. As the audience in the Fox Theater fell into the final days of the 1956 Christmas season, up on screen they would see the cinematic remains of Disneyland's 1955 Christmas season, the festive circus parade that rolled down Main Street to kick off the poorly attended Mickey Mouse Club Circus, which had been the centerpiece holiday entertainment at the park the previous year. But one of the elements still missing from the park during its second year was a holiday parade. In 1957, Disneyland managers decided to include a parade as part of their yearly holiday pageant. The parade was tied to the park's 1957 holiday theme, Christmas Around the World for Christmas in Many Lands. The parade itself would be better known as the Parade of Many Nations, and from its start was focused on the ways that people celebrated the holidays throughout the world. Unlike modern parades in the park, this one was held only once each year. A daily parade themed to the holidays wasn't a concept managers at Disney had yet invented. The approach to the first holiday parade of the park was modeled after the type of holiday parade that appeared in cities across the country. A one-time performance with local bands, equestrian units, and live announcers whose voice was amplified over a rented PA system. This was the exact approach that Disneyland used to arrange its first holiday parade right down to the rented PA system. That first year, Walt assigned artist Bruce Bushman, one of the original designers of Disneyland, the task of art directing and developing the parade. For years, Disney had contributed small floats to local parades in California, including the Anaheim Halloween Parade and the Tournament of Roses Parade. Artists and craftspeople at the studio had some experience in float and parade design, but Bruce Bushman wasn't asked to create an isolated unit or a single float for a parade. He was asked to design the whole thing. To begin with, he listed out over 30 countries whose holiday culture might be featured in the pageant, from Israel to Mexico, perhaps represented by piñatas, to China, perhaps represented by fireworks, to Scotland with bagpipes, to France with Father Christmas, and so on. Bushman then narrowed down these options to a far more manageable list, depending on the draft, of between 8 to 12 countries representing regions from around the world, from Asia to Central America, from Europe to the Middle East. By this point, Bushman also liked the idea of the three wise men moving down Main Street on live camels. Beyond this, he thought Disneyland might build small floats to represent these countries or perhaps acquire costumes from a stage rental company. 
With this, he began to organize the parade into individual units with a central theme. Austria would be represented by a St. Nicholas figure in bishop's attire with a staff and a white beard. England would be represented by a yule log and a boar's head and a knight in jousting armor. The piñatas were changed out for a children's Posada unit to represent Mexico. From there, Bushman asked friends and Disney employees how to say Happy Holidays and Merry Christmas in other languages. He also asked for the correct spelling and accent marks for each phrase in case he wanted to use them on banners. As he moved more into research, he discovered that the Disney company itself might not need to make all of the materials for an international parade. Some of it could be provided by youth and cultural groups. A Polish youth organization he found could supply everything, including performers, for a unit focused on holiday customs in Poland. In one list titled Costumes Christmas Parade, Bushman added, quote, nothing needed next to the entry for Poland. Likewise, nothing they needed for Spain, Sweden, and then others. In this way, the approach to the parade shifted more toward community organization. At the park itself, Tommy Walker and the staff in the entertainment department coordinated the visiting groups to be featured in the parade. Just like a city parade, the event would have no unified rehearsals. Individual units would line up backstage and, as announced over the PA system, simply move into the park. Quote, Tommy Walker and his staff, Disneyland executive Jack Sayers said, have brought together the people, the customs, the costumes, and music of Christmas from all parts of the world for a combination parade and festival that has never been attempted. Truly, it'll be a spectacle in the finest Disneyland tradition. In the end, the first Disneyland parade of many nations was to be a collage event, with some elements created by artists at the Disney studio, such as crowns, masks, and hats that could be reused from year to year, some of it rented from movie or stage supply companies, such as traditional costumes to represent world cultures, and many props and signs from community groups who also marched and performed in the parade. Originally scheduled for Sunday, December 15th, it was delayed a week due to rain. On December 22nd, at 2 p.m., the parade featured, quote, the traditional Christmas celebrations and customs in European, Asian, and Latin American countries. No Disney characters, no float with Santa, no comic reindeer. Those elements wouldn't grace the park's Christmas parade until the early 1960s. Instead, the parade celebrated world cultures. It included a matador drill team, kabuki dancers, a Scottish bagpipe band, and German singers. In all, it featured the customs of 37 individual countries with 2,000 participants and Walt Disney as Grand Marshal. It also included elements of nativity scenes, such as the three wise men, just as Bushmen imagined, on actual camels riding down Main Street. The only official Disneyland unit in the whole parade that first year was the unit of carolers that Disneyland hired from USC each December. In the 10 days leading up to Christmas, the international pageant expanded out into individual events celebrating world cultures, much like World Showcase at Epcot would do decades later, as part of its Holidays Around the World theme. On December 15th, the park featured song and dance performance highlighting the customs of Scotland, Ireland, and England. On the 16th, Ukraine and Greece. On the 17th, Japan and the Philippines. On the 18th, Poland, Finland, and Lithuania. This continued for a total of nine days, with groups representing Czechoslovakia, South America, Switzerland, Italy, Mexico, and other countries. The groups performed around the park, from Plaza Gardens to Frontierland. Some musical performance was even featured in Town Square, now the location for the park's 48-foot tree. Again that year, most of the decorations were arranged on the lower portion of the tree. But in the late 1950s, to better decorate the upper half, a manufacturing firm hitched a bosun's chair up to a crane, where, in a seated position, one member of the manufacturing team dangled midair as the cable raised and lowered him to place lights and ornaments on the upper boughs. Thank you. 
That same year, 1957, the park continued to invite choirs to perform individually. But again, Dr. Hurt, early in the holiday season, organized multiple choirs to perform together as a massed or blended choir inside the park. That year, the masked choir expanded to 900 singers. This time, they moved through the park, ending in the plaza not far from the castle. It was not yet the candlelight ceremony, but it was a processional and a performance, something far larger than it existed when the park first opened. The following year, both of these festivities continued to expand, with the festival name shortened officially to just Christmas in Many Lands. The parade held on December 21st included 3,500 participants with 50 international groups. Some of the new performing groups showcased the cultures of Sweden and Australia. Also in 1958, the park formalized the massed choir performance into a candlelight processional in which choirs moved together down Main Street singing traditional Christmas songs. In its first year, the processional was performed five times, four evening performances from December 20th through the 23rd, and one afternoon performance on Christmas Eve featuring a youth choir. Each processional in part was performed in Town Square, with over a dozen choirs gathered around the flagpole. Quote, when we first did the ceremony in 1958, Dr. Hurt explained, the carolers all gathered around the flagpole in Town Square. It was a beautiful ceremony, but we made one mistake. It was difficult for people to see since the singers were all in a circle with me in the center conducting. So the next year, bleachers were constructed adjacent to the train station. So the carolers were facing the spectators on Main Street. In 1959, Candlelight expanded out to 2,200 singers. In the years that followed, choirs arranged themselves on the steps of the train station so crowds could better see them. Some singers arranged in the center were positioned on risers to form a living Christmas tree. The music was decidedly religious, with performances of Glory of the Lord and the Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's Messiah. In 1961, the first celebrity narrator was actor Dennis Morgan, who, with 875 singers, moved down Main Street to gather at the train station where he narrated the traditional Christmas story, The Birth of Christ, presented in the New Testament Gospels. In 1959, the international events, now growing in complexity, were moved to the week after Christmas. On December 26, the park celebrated Christmas in Latin America. This included song and dance groups featured on stages throughout the park, but also at 6.30 after dusk settled across Disneyland. Children moved down Main Street holding candles in a Posada parade where they sang traditional holiday songs. The parade ended in Frontierland where groups continued to sing and dance until the park closed at 9 p.m. Again this year, on various stages, the park celebrated the holiday customs of European countries, Scandinavian countries, the countries of Asia, the British Isles, the Philippines, and Hawaii, which earlier that year had become the 50th state. Along with this, the park featured 10-foot-tall figures of the three wise men, both in the parade and afterward positioned around the park, to evoke the tradition of the Three Kings Day, which was celebrated in Spain and other Latin countries. The Disneyland Parade would continue as a single-day event until 1961 when the park added a separate parade, largely inspired by the film Babes in Toyland, to move down Main Street. Twice a day, during the week before and after Christmas, wooden soldiers, life-size dolls, various wind-up wonders, and enormous haunted trees from the Forest of No Return section of the film moved down Main Street in the park's first regularly operating holiday parade. With this, two of the park's best-known traditions were in place, those that were most memorable to visitors in the late 1950s and the early 1960s. But beyond this, there was another equally important tradition that developed during this period, one that was mostly invisible to the public. For decades, Disney employees at the studio 
had developed their own wintertime traditions. And in the late 1950s, the park slowly developed events that would shape the traditions of its own employees, employees who would later be called cast members. During the park's first holiday season, just five months after its opening, Disneyland Incorporated, a company separate from Walt Disney Productions, was too broke and too new to arrange much of anything in the way of a celebration. A few days before Christmas, C.V. Wood, the park's first general manager who was in the process of being fired, asked one of his assistants to buy every employee a Christmas turkey, a gift that would hopefully endear him to his staff. On the following day, from the back of a truck, frozen turkeys were distributed to enthusiastic employees. But as one of those early employees, Bill Sully Sullivan, recalls even this had a cost. Quote, Walt got pissed because the park didn't have the money, he said. During Disneyland's second year, even though the company was still in difficult financial straits, a community began to develop inside the park. Like many companies in the 1950s, Disneyland Incorporated radiated the ideal that employment encompassed both a person's work life and his or her social life. This is likely an ideal that many Americans absorbed during the war when military or war-related service consumed a person's entire life, both work activities and social events. By 1956, Disneyland, as a company, was very much moving toward this post-war model when a full-time employer took care of most of its employees' full-time needs. The park had softball and basketball teams, a golf club, a bowling league, which met every Thursday after park closing at Fullerton Lanes. The park would soon have a square dancing club, a bridge club, and also host formal dinners. In 1956, the park set about to arrange its first employee Christmas party. The first annual Disneyland Family Christmas Party was held on Monday, December 10th, and was attended by 500 adults and 900 children, with all of them gathered in Fantasyland. As the park was closed that year on Mondays, they had the place to themselves. The event was arranged by the employees for the employees, with Bryant Baker of the maintenance department overseeing its organization. Employees donated their time to operate the rides and concessions, with some parents choosing to work one half of the event while spending the other half with their kids. The employee newsletter would later describe the event as follows, quote, Around and around, the teacup spun, bidding the children to join in the fun, while above, the sky ride was offering a bird's eye view of the fun and color below. In 1956, Disneyland, largely to ensure financial solvency, was filled with outside lessees who ran restaurants and stores throughout the park. The lessees largely donated the food, snacks, and cups for the party, drinks from the Coca-Cola Bottling Company, hot dogs from UPT who ran the food carts at the park, as well as other offerings from Carnation, Swifts & Company, and the 4S Bakery. Throughout Fantasyland, 2,000 hot dogs and 2,000 drinks were sold for a nickel each. In 1956, Disneyland didn't yet own character costumes. In the mid-1950s, the Mickey, Minnie, and Donald costumes, occasionally seen at the park, were borrowed from the ice capades during the holidays or the performing group's off-season. The costumes worn by employees were included in the party, as was a visit from Santa Claus. Santa was played by Hensley Morgan of the Disneyland Security Department, who passed out gifts wrapped by members of the park's first aid department to young children who waited in line. In an era in which each ride required a ticket, Disneyland donated the rides as well as some of the drinks and supplies. The next year, in 1957, the employee party expanded to a larger event, held on Monday, December 16th, a day that the park closed early to the public, shutting its gates at 5 p.m. This event began in Holidayland, a short-lived corporate picnic area at the edge of the park, roughly where the show building for Pirates of the Caribbean and the Haunted Mansion would later be built. The event began at 6 p.m., with cast member families entering in to the newly built Holidayland playground area which held slides and swings for the kids. The area also included a baseball diamond, picnic tables, 
and the massive circus tent left over from the Mickey Mouse Club Circus, where now various Disneyland entertainers, such as the Golden Horseshoe players, perform songs and magic tricks for the kids. Food was still cheap, with soda, coffee, and ice cream just a nickel. During regular park hours, depending on where you ate, a single scoop of ice cream or sherbet in comparison would cost between 20 and 30 cents. This year, hot dogs at the party were now a dime. At 7.30, the park opened up the Fantasyland area for employees and their children, including the newest rides at the edge of the park, namely Midget Autopia, Junior Autopia, and the Viewliner. The third annual Christmas party, held on Tuesday, December 16th, also in Fantasyland, though employees were advised, quote, there is a possibility that areas of Tomorrowland and Frontierland may be pressed into service if the response to the party invitation is as widespread as it was last year. The fourth annual party was held on Monday, December 14th, again around the park's newest attractions, such as the Matterhorn. By now, the park was on firm financial ground with a large year-round workforce. That casual first party, with its 1,400 attendees, had now more than tripled to a party consisting of over 5,000 guests. And from there, it continued to grow. But to get back to where we started on this episode, the park's second holiday season in 1956, I have one last thing. For Southern California locals taking the LA Times, they would have found something special in the newspaper on Christmas morning. A lengthy interview with Walt Disney penned by columnist and friend Hedda Hopper. Quote, to me, Hopper began, Walt Disney is a combination of Peter Pan and Santa Claus, a magical person who has brought beauty and delight to the children of the world. He is the greatest success story in town. In this interview, Walt talked about some of his recent frustrations, how not long ago he was ready to sell the studio. Quote, I meant it when I told you I was ready to sell, he explained, but my wife made me promise I'd take a rest in the desert before I made up my mind. So we went to Palm Springs, where I put myself in the hand of a general practitioner, not one of these fancy specialists. No wonder drugs, just eat and sleep and some iron to build up the red corpuscles. I came back raring to go. When Hopper asked Walt about growing up, he explained, I never have, and I know more adults who have the kids' approach to life. They're not the people you and me meet in circles we move in. They're people who don't give a hang what the Joneses do. I see them at my park every time I go there. They're not ashamed to be delighted with simple pleasures, and they have a degree of contentment with what life has brought. Sometimes it isn't much either. Then Walt added, I run into another kind too, those with a chip on their shoulder. They ask me why I don't have a place where parents can lie down while kids run around. And when you talk about the child and every adult, Walt said, you should see as I have. Four nuns riding the tender of the steam engine, their faces as bright and laughing as any of their charges. When Walt was asked why he had no Santa Claus at Disneyland for children, he responded, they get that at the department stores. Disneyland, he suggested, should offer something different than the experiences offered outside the park. It was a lesson brought home for him in a large way the previous year when he had arranged the Mickey Mouse Club Circus. We had top flying acts like the Alexanders, he explained. We brought an axe from all over the world. We charged 50 cents, but couldn't fill the tent. It cost a fortune and I lost my shirt. The kids were more impressed in the acts of Disneyland. This year, we settled for some general Christmas atmosphere, trees, bands, and a music festival. Walt then commented on how much of his personal time and money were invested in the studio and the park. If you asked me to write a check for $10,000 at this moment, he told Hopper, I don't think I could do it. But as always, during Disneyland's early years, he was focused on the park's improvement. You have to spend money. If I level off and stop, Disneyland will die. 
So I keep adding things like Liberty Street and Gay 90s Square. I'll spend $750,000 this year animating more animals, refurbishing and putting in shade canopies that wouldn't cut out too much light. I've spent $400,000 and only got $100,000 for it. Then again, I've spent $30,000 and had $100,000 in return. Throughout the interview, Walt sounded upbeat, enthusiastic, ready to expand his park as he saw fit. A park that Disney shareholders didn't yet control as it wasn't yet fully part of Walt Disney Productions. At one point, he confided, Now I've started my 45-year plan. I expect to break 100. This, of course, wouldn't happen. He was beginning his final decade, perhaps the most productive period of his adult life. And on that Christmas morning, in newspapers delivered across Southern California, readers could sense his optimism, the way he imagined the future opening just like a gift. I'll be back in a few days on Sunday to continue our story of Herb Ryman, a key artist who helped define the look of Disney films and the Disney parks in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and far beyond. In this Sunday's episode, Ryman is still moving through Thailand, Japan, and China, hoping to expand his art, but his life is moving toward the point where he is about to see the Disney studio as a place that his own career as an artist might soon move. As you know, we are an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. We do just two things. Deep dives on stories related to the history of the Disney studio and parks, and news and analysis of current events as they relate to the Disney company. We're funded entirely by listener contributions. You can support our efforts by becoming a monthly Bandcamp subscriber. On Bandcamp, you'll find over 100 episodes not available on iTunes. But the best reason to join is to support the work we do here. You can become a monthly subscriber over at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link down in the show notes. Until next time, this is Todd James Pierce.